Okay, welcome. My name is Michael Tarver, and I'm a professor of history, now retired at Arkansas Tech University. And this is a podcast uh, being recorded for the Grupo de Estudios Venezuela Estados Unidos, uh, which is housed at the Universidad de los Andes in Merida, Venezuela. Uh, we are pleased today to welcome to our podcast Dr. John Lombardi, Professor Emeritus of, uh, of History at uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Lombardi has a long and distinguished career in the field of Latin American history, as well as a similar career in higher education administration, serving uh, as provost and vice president for academic affairs at Johns Hopkins University, uh, uh, president of uh, the University of Florida, chancellor of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and president of the Louisiana State University System in my hometown, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. It is, of course, in the field of Venezuelan history uh, that we're excited to, uh, to meet and talk with uh, Dr. Lombardi today. For those of us who have studied Venezuelan history, uh, the contributions of Dr. Lombardi cannot be understated. From his early works on the colonial and immediate post-colonial period, uh, through his classic uh, Venezuela, The Search for Order, The Dream of Progress, to his most recent contributions to the English translation of Germán Carrera Damas' study of former Venezuelan President Romulo Betancourt. I should also point out that 45 years ago, Dr. Lombardi was elected for membership into the Venezuelan National Academy of History uh, as a corresponding member, uh, an honor that I just recently received, and so I'll have to be 110 before I, I, I reach that same milestone. Um, it would take all of our time uh, today just to list Dr. Lombardi's contributions to the historiography of Venezuelan history. So I will just summarize by saying that he is, in the opinion of many, including myself and Professor Francisco Soto, who is with us today, uh, he is the preeminent U.S.-based scholar on Venezuelan history. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lombardi. Well, I'm pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Um, what, uh, what we'd like to do is go through a, just a series of, of, of questions uh, to get uh, some uh, uh, some of your thoughts, uh, not only on your work uh, in, uh, in the field, but also then uh, the work of uh, Herman Carrera Damas, whose, whose book uh, I see in, on your bookshelf in, uh, in the back, uh, but his recent work uh, on, uh, on Romulo Betancourt, or the, at least the English translation of that, uh, of that earlier work. Um, so you are now going on six decades of research on Venezuela. Uh, can you briefly tell us uh, what attracted you to, to the field back in the, the mid-1960s? Yeah. Well, uh, that's an interesting story. You know, <clears throat> I, I'm, a, I'm a product of the earlier age of graduate study in which uh, uh, aspiring students went to work with distinguished faculty at other universities and pretty much did what they were told. Uh, <clears throat> today, of course, nobody does what they're told, so it's a much better and more interesting world. But in those days, <clears throat> I was working with uh, Lewis Hankey at Columbia University, who, as you know, is the premier historian of early colonial history. And, uh, you know, I went with the idea that uh, I would uh, uh, pursue Mexican history uh, because uh, I'd spend some time in Mexico, lived with a Mexican family, married a girl who was eventually who was uh, uh, grew up right on the border in, in Mexicali in Mexico. So. You know, I thought that was my place. In fact, I wrote my first article on Mexico. So after my first year there, I went back to uh, my mentor, Hanky, and I said, well, I'm here's what I want to do my work on in this area, Mexico. I'd done some research, had a bibliography. I was just ready to go. And he said, that's nice, but I think you should work on Venezuela. <laughs> and I, I said, well, Venezuela? He said, yeah. He says, I have students in Mexico, but I don't have any students in Venezuela. He says, you go work on Venezuela. So I went home and I said to my wife, I said, Catherine, we're going to Venezuela. <laughs> and she said, where's that? I said, I don't know. Let's get a map. Uh, so <laughs> we, we got a map and I started reading about Venezuela and one thing led to another. And I've spent the rest of my life dealing with Venezuela. So that's... Uh, that's uh, the wise, profound way by which I arrived at Venezuela. And I'm very thankful for his judgment that it was a good place to study. I met great people. I had some exciting times. And uh, Venezuelan history was uh, 
an area that wasn't overworked by Americans. So it was uh, something interesting and uh, possible to make a sort of useful contribution now and then. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, Lewis Hankey eventually, I, I want to say, wound up at, at in Amherst as well, right? Didn't he? Well, Lewis Hankey's been everywhere. He, he, <laughs> he left Columbia and went to Texas and he was there. And uh, uh, so he's been around a lot. And, uh, he, you know, he's an extraordinarily prolific. He was an extraordinarily prolific scholar on colonial Latin America. And uh, we used to have these seminars in which he was a great bibliophile. And we had one of my fellow students was also a great bibliophile, which I'm not, but he was. And so he would cite three books and, and, and Hanky would cite four. And so then a student would sign five and then, and so it was exciting times, but Lewis always won. Yes. Yes. I can, uh, I can imagine. Um, you, you have spent the last uh, few decades uh, in, as I mentioned, higher education administration. And, and that obviously means that you've devoted your, your attention to things other than perhaps uh, Venezuelan academic pursuits. With that said, however, uh, and recognizing that, there have been changes that have occurred while you were away from the field. Can you give us your thoughts on how the focus of the academic field of Venezuelan history has, has changed from when you began? Well, you know, the, the topics change as the times change. And so uh, uh, there's tremendous amount of interest in Venice, contemporary Venezuela, as you know, uh, because Venezuela is a conflicted area and therefore draws lots of attention. Uh, not only because it's interesting in itself, but because what happens in Venezuela is of interest to many other partisans around the world, whether the Chinese or the Russians or the Cubans or the Americans or other uh, Latin American countries. They they all keep their eye on Venezuela because the warfare that's going on there, uh, both political and other forms of activism, uh, have lessons uh, for other parts of the world. And so uh, one of the things you see a lot of is commentary and, and discussion and research focused on sort of contemporary events. And, and I, I think uh, I, I think that's perfectly normal because Venezuela is an extraordinary place, as you know, because it's stuck there in the middle of everybody's fight. <laughs> and so and when, when people want to fight, they, they often uh, take Venezuela as a place to do it in. And so the, the Cubans always want to take over Venezuela and have for a long time and uh, and uh, uh, countries that want to uh, sort of harass the United States in one way or another. Uh, they figure that Venezuela is a good place to do that uh, because uh, we won't invade. And uh, and so if we don't like what's going on, uh, they can get some advantage. And then finally, Venezuela is a country with extraordinary resources. And so as a result, uh, it is a prize for whoever has the ability to control it, whether the Venezuelans themselves or whether there are others who are participating in that activity. And, and so, so Venezuela is something uh, that the international community has always had a great interest in trying to uh, get a piece of. The other thing that happens in Venezuela, of course, is that there's lots of very smart Venezuelans. And so the Venezuelan talent pool is a serious issue because uh, in the current circumstances, uh, there's been a generation, uh, some significant portion of which has gone elsewhere, uh, whether they've gone to Spain or whether they've gone to other Latin American countries or come to the U.S. or gone uh, someplace else. Uh, there's been there's been a, a, a drain of talent of some kinds there that, that has caused some consternation and commentary. Uh, thank you. Um... Professor uh, Soto uh, uh, submitted um, the question about, do you consider that uh, Herman Carrera Damas's concept of historiography uh, changed throughout his career? And can you maybe hit on that since you've worked with him for 60 years? Yeah, well, of course, we all change over time. There's no escape from that. Uh, but Herman has always been an extraordinarily uh, committed to the idea uh, that history is a composed of a of a interplay between ideas and action, and uh, he see, he's seen that from different perspectives. So early on, he did a great deal of work, of course, on on uh, the independence period and and the warfare in that area uh, to try and uh, set the record straight from what was officialistic historiography, and so he brought a new perspective that looked at the documents and uh, and treated uh, various elements. 
in the Venezuelan uh, development uh, with great uh, attention to accuracy and correctness and understanding without uh, falling into sort of officialist history, which was very popular for a period in Venezuela. And uh, over the years, he's become more international, perhaps, in his uh, perspective. As you know, he's participated in very large historiographical projects sponsored by UNESCO. I uh, did a history of the Americas. He participated, was a director of a large part of that, contributed many volumes. And uh, and, uh, and so his, his vision is very broad. And part of the reason for that is that he's become... Uh, involved in the international presence of Venezuela when he served as ambassador to various countries. And that's uh, also provided him with a perspective uh, that is much broader than most of us have. And so um, uh, I've always benefited from that uh, breadth of perspective. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, he, he's a true Venezuelan patriot and and he's focused on, <clears throat> and always been focused on uh, how Venezuela moves over time uh, t uh, towards a more democratic and participatory form of of governance and and operation, and uh, uh, he he takes a much longer view than most people who see uh, Venezuela as sort of a crisis, a moment. Uh, he he sees it, of course, in a much longer range, uh, and 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 recognizes that the process of developing a, a functioning democracy is not something that happens overnight with uh, with one conquest, it happens over time as you build institutions and construct ideas and create in, uh, economic uh, capacity to engage with the larger world. So, I, I think I think his view uh, has has gotten broader and uh, more uh, international in one sense, as well as uh, has remained focused on the future development of Venezuela. And of course, like uh, many people. Uh, he worries a lot about uh, uh, the progress uh, that Venezuela is making or not making at the moment. And so uh, uh, he, he does worry about that, but but he has a very long perspective. I should also say that uh, among <clears throat> modern historians, he, he is much less uh, focused on economic causation than many of us. <clears throat> and, and <clears throat> excuse me. He and I argue about that uh, because he sees ideas as being uh, more important in his history, and I tend to think that uh, uh, money matters. So we 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 have some uh, conversations about that, but he's very tolerant of me, and so that works out well. All right, um, thank you. Um, you you mentioned uh, Carrera Damas's uh, sort of approach uh, of looking at the long path to to democracy. And obviously, Romulo Betancourt has has played an important role in that uh, in in that voyage. Um, can can you give us maybe your interpretation of the importance of of President Betancourt, both as a, as a social leader uh, within, let's say, the Venezuelan movement, uh, uh, as well as a a politician or a political leader? Well, you know, I. I... I think you can't separate all of that. I, I think the social structure of, of Venezuela uh, has, has uh, changed dramatically over the years uh, for when Betancourt started to, <coughs> excuse me, to where we are today. And one of the things that happened is literacy went up. One of the things that happened is, <coughs> and, and Herman, um, <coughs> excuse me, Herman uh, emphasizes that uh, the engagement of women in political activity and social work and, and economic activity has been uh, dramatic in the periods uh, since uh, uh, <clears throat> since the fall of Gomez. And so uh, this this engagement uh, of, of a broader sections of society has been clearly one of the characteristics of Venezuela uh, over those over those years. In addition, the the evolution of social structures, whether they're the unions or whether they're the organization of business or whether they're the organization of <clears throat> universities, uh, these organizations have become uh, uh, more significant and more powerful uh, within the interplay of society. <clears throat> so I, I think um, I, I think what you see in, in, in Venezuela is the difficulty of uh, of carrying forward all of these ideas 
and activities uh, when the economy goes into trouble. Uh, because uh, with a weak economy, what happens is that society fragments and it fragments into sections, some of which are uh, focused on maintaining uh, uh, a prosperous status quo for some and in other areas uh, designed to try and uh, leverage uh, uh, short-term advantages. Also, I think in recent uh, decades, the power of the drug industry uh, has been a, become a very significant element uh, that's very hard to study, but nonetheless uh, can't be ignored in the inter interplay that goes on between uh, Venezuela and the countries that surround it and the countries that uh, transit uh, uh, drugs through the, 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 the economy of Venezuela. And, and um, there's all kinds of uh, talk, uh, but not very much substance in our understanding of exactly how that works uh, because Venezuela is not necessarily a producer of drugs, but is, is clearly in the transit path you know, that goes from where producers are to where consumers are, and whether it goes through Cuba or whether it goes through Central America or, or where it goes through Europe, uh, there, there's, there's a, a flow there uh, that is um, uh, powerful enough financially to distort society. And um, it's not the only place this occurs, uh, but but uh, when you have that much money floating around through uh, sort of non-standard and non-institutionalized uh, uh, systems, it's hard to build a good uh, democratic structure. It's hard to sustain institutions uh, when the institutions are competing. That is, the official institutions are competing with unofficial institutions that are very wealthy and powerful. <clears throat> and so I, I think the interplay of all of that which is not unique in any way to Venezuela, but is nonetheless uh, having a, a significant impact in Venezuela uh, is, is something that uh, we do not know enough about. Thank you. Um, uh, Francisco, did you have a question you wanted to ask at, at this point, uh, other than what I've asked? I have one more that, that I'll conclude with. Well, uh, Professor, Lombardi, do you miss writing about Venezuelan history? Writing about Venezuela? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, well, yes, I'm, I'll tell you a story about that. Uh, a, as you know, I got drafted into uh, university administration uh, rather early. And one of the things that happens in the United States uh, in many universities is that when you're a Venezuelan, your audience is small. Okay, your audience is small. So uh, when I was teaching U.S. history, because I was a young scholar, and uh, when you're a young scholar uh, in the old days in, in uh, the U.S. history department, they always made you teach the U.S. survey because nobody wanted to teach it. And so, and so I taught classes of 350 students, okay, 350 students. Now, I'm no expert on U.S. history. I don't know anything, but I knew a little bit more than they did, so I would teach these classes. And then when I got more advanced and had the opportunity uh, to teach other classes, I, I would do a seminar or something on Venezuela. Uh, but if I wanted to do something that drew students, which is important to have a volume of students uh, attend your, your classes, I had to teach something else. Because if I put up a class on Venezuelan history, I'd have 12 really good students, but there'd only be 12, right? Where about my friends who are teaching advanced courses in US history, they'd have 50 or 60. And so I'd have to find other things to teach. And so I would teach class on race and class in the Americas. Now I would draw a hundred students, you know, and so then I could justify my existence. <clears throat> and uh, then later on, I, I would teach courses. Uh, uh, I, taught a, I, I taught a sequence of courses for a long time on intercollegiate sports in America, which has nothing to do with Latin America, of course, but it had 120 students. And so the history department liked me because I had 120 students. And furthermore, I didn't take any students away from Latin American topics. So the Latin American topics, they could have good numbers of students in their courses. And so I didn't have much opportunity to teach about Venezuela except for seminars. And we had a number of seminars and colloquia where we did Venezuelan themes and, and did research and, and had fun. Uh, but, but in the US, if you can't draw students uh, for these kind of courses, you, you, you're in trouble. 
And so, and so I've always taught courses in, in, in history and I've always had a good number of students, but almost never have I been able to teach the course that I was trained to do, which is teach the history of Venezuela. <laughs> in sad. contrast, uh, in Venezuela, uh, your books still are uh, appreciated by students in bachelor's, master's and doctorate courses. Oh, well, that's very comforting to know because, I mean, I like writing those books and I like dealing with Venezuela. We lived uh, <clears throat> we lived in Caracas uh, uh, for a number of years. Uh, we have lived there two or three years when I was doing the dissertation. And then we came back multiple summers and we had a uh, we had a Fulbright Hayes program uh, that ran uh, with some uh, outstanding uh, students. Uh, a sort of collaboration between Carrera Damas and myself. And he, he had, I forget, five students and I had five graduate students and, and we worked together on a project in, in Venezuela. And uh, over a summer, I guess we were there a couple of months, three months. It was great. We had a wonderful time. Uh, but I haven't been back much since, especially as the situation deteriorated. I didn't expect that I would be a persona welcomed by uh, various categories of people. So I stayed out of trouble. When um, we were, uh, when we were uh, doing our, our, our work in Venezuela, uh, the, uh, part of the theme was to try to get the Venezuelan students and our students together working on a data project that used computers. And that was in the very early stages because we had punch cards. You know, I mean, you don't even know what they are. But, but but we did punch cards and uh, we collected uh, you know statistical data on the population and I had to go to some bizarre office somewhere in downtown Caracas where they had the right machine to run these punch cards for us and they made me write programs for it which I didn't know how to do but they were tolerant when I screwed up and eventually we had a, we had a really good time we learned a lot and uh, it was very successful. Well, it, it's. I know what punch cards are. Maybe uh, Francisco doesn't, but uh, um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, 20 years ago, I'm going uh, to uh, sort of close up with this question, and then we'll give you a chance to maybe add anything else that, that you would like uh, for our, our viewers to, uh, uh, to be aware of. But uh, 20 years ago, you wrote that Venezuela had what, what you called a, a permanent dilemma. And then you go on to briefly discuss the nation's lack of institutional development and, and an economy that was based on uh, the extractive engine. Uh, I probably should say that, you know, really it's the economy, the political support, social development, all of that it was based on the extractive uh, um, uh, engine and the success of that, uh, of that model. If we fast forward to 2021, uh, when you mentioned Venezuela's unprecedented implosion of its overall uh, economy and the, its dramatic disintegration of its democratic traditions and institutions. Um, you know, where do you see this sort of dilemma, this permanent dilemma that really 20 years ago you 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 were discussing, and you know, still today Venezuela is is trapped in that uh, in that cycle. Well, you know, uh, several things have happened over the years that uh, make the process of institutional development difficult. Uh, on, on one side, there's the tremendous fragmentation of political parties and interest groups in Venezuela, which prevented the development of any <clears throat> kind of coherent <clears throat> power center. And one of the things that you get from, from uh, uh, Herman's book on Betancourt is the extraordinary efforts he went to to build an institutional party that was capable of sustaining uh, a consistent uh, development perspective, a consistent polit political and policy perspective over time, and and uh, and follow uh, follow these results to try to build uh, the institutions that are required to sustain a country's development. Uh, people spend too little time worrying about institutions and too much time worrying about the subsurface of, of uh, policy where people rant and rave and talk slogans and, and uh, throw things, uh, which, is, which is satisfying to throw things, but it, it, is the, it is the institutional basis that will carry you to develop over time, teach people how to do things, provide the structure that lets people learn how to, how to succeed. 
and that are able to sustain the, the rule of law in some form uh, over time. And that's very difficult to do. You have to build these institutions uh, over time. But to have time, you need money and you need to have a consistent political base to have the time to build these institutions. So in Venezuela for a period, I had both the time and the money and, and, the, and the political uh, organization to begin the process of building uh, these institutions and some remnants of them still exist and function within Venezuela, uh, but, but not to the extent that we would have hoped. And uh, uh, this is further exacerbated, of course, today uh, by the decline in the resource base. Right? And that decline, we can argue at great length whether that decline is simply the result of, of changes in the world or whether it's the result of the uh, extraordinary mismanagement of, of uh, Venezuela's core assets of the petroleum industry. Uh, uh, I don't want to get into that because I'm not sure I know enough, but <laughs> it's certainly obvious that's what's going on. And so as a result, since you have you still have money, but the money is smaller, the amounts of money relative to the population need is smaller. And what that means is the rich get that money. Okay, the rich get that money, and that money doesn't go into the subsurface that builds institutions and creates structures and, and creates education and, and creates all that middle level stuff that sustains an operational society. Instead, gradually it, it drifts into the hands of the operators, into the hands of, of the big time uh, merchants, in the hands of the people who control power, who end up spending most of their time trying to get their share of the money to smaller and smaller groups of, of people. And then of course, outsiders come in from all over the world and wanna take advantage of the disorganization that is there and the need for cash that is there uh, to buy and sell within Venezuela with ways that <clears throat> don't contribute to the growth of the Venezuelan uh, state, to them, the great population and, and infrastructure. So that those are the issues that are unresolved at the moment and they're not sustainable. You can't do that forever. You know, eventually it breaks down and it can break down because somebody invades. It can break down because, you know, eventually the military doesn't get paid. And so they lead a revolution or something like that happens. OK, I don't know what will happen because I got no insight into that. But but it's not not it's not a stable, sustainable growth system. And so as a result, you can see the country backslide. Right? You see the exodus of people. You see them going over the Colombian border and coming up, uh, migrating to the United States, people who have some money, uh, they, they go to, as I said before, they go to Spain or they go to some other Latin American country or they uh, go to the United States or wherever they go, where they can get a job and take care of their families. And if their families stay in Venezuela, they send money back. And that's, that's not a method uh, for institutional development and for national prosperity. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, then finally, just, um, you know, I'll just sort of open it up uh, to you if there's there's anything that, that you wanted to add to, you know, sort of your, you know, outlook of, uh, you know, uh, on Venezuelan history or Venezuelan historiography or, um, you know, on Carrera Damas, uh, anything in, in that regard, just to kind of conclude this podcast? Sure. Uh, I think you all should buy the book. <laughs> I have it. I have it. Yeah, everybody who reads English, the, the problem, one of the problems of Venezuela, of course, is there aren't enough books in English. Okay, I mean, there's a lot of, there are a lot of contemporary books, maybe with political views, but the kind of depth of, of uh, English language historiography uh, is thin. And, and so uh, part of the reasons that Carrera was so interested in seeing uh, his book in print in English was to see if we could reach that audience. Uh, but it's hard to reach that audience because uh, Venezuela is not uh, at the top of mind in 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 uh, his history is not time, top of mind of the historian historian's business and so uh, I just want to tell everybody you ought to buy a copy of the book. <laughs> All right, um, my, thank you. Um, uh, actually, uh, I mentioned to you the the, the group has been putting uh, uh, works out uh, on uh, on the the server. Uh, for uh, for folks to be able to access free, and we've got one coming out soon uh, in English uh, uh, by uh, uh, Marcus Golding, who is uh, at the University of Texas, a p doctoral student there, um, 
And uh, so we're excited. I think, uh, Francisco, it'll be launched within the next month. Does that sound right? Yes. Yeah. And next month, we we will publish the this book. Okay. Good. So I will. Uh, I'll send you a, an email when uh, uh, when it gets launched. Okay. Well, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Lombardi, for for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon. We appreciate your insight. We appreciate the work that you have done for Venezuelan history. And we appreciate you taking time to uh, sort of share your your thoughts and ideas with our uh, our viewers. It's great being with a bunch of Venezuelans. Thank you.